a lot of people eyeing the close today, but a lot of people also eyeing the data that we're going to get on Friday uh, mm -hmm. with regards to inflation. A pretty big print expected, if you believe what the economists expect. Probably one of the biggest year-over-year -year changes in consumer prices, at least since the early 80s, maybe since the late 70s here. Does that concern you at all? Well, I think what's interesting about the inflation debate, um, and I'm going to go back to is it transitory, is it not, it sort of it was a false setup. Because we know that we're experiencing inflation. Now the question is to what degree and why and how and is it structural and systemic? And so the supply chain disruption component of that, um, most uh, corporations believe that it's temporary, which is why we at Morgan Stanley think that we sort of normalize uh, mid, you know, next year around that. We don't think that the Fed starts to raise rates until 2023. Um, overall, although it looks like the market right now is pricing in like a couple of hikes for 2022. So what we could see the Fed do um, is uh, accelerate the tapering, right? I think right now it's set to sort of end in July, so maybe we pull that back to March. Um, we believe at Morgan Stanley that the tapering, while, you know, basically is a way to sort of taper the market because it's essentially queuing the market for future rate hikes. Now, I think where a lot of investors kind of get tossed up is not quite understanding that the economy and economic data and the market are parallel universes that operate in different time zones, right? So the market is present forward thinking, economic data in arrears. And even if you look back at the pandemic, we, we bottomed out like in March down 34%. That recession didn't even get called until June. Yeah. So what the Fed's trying to do is project forward. So let's talk about some of those real time impacts mm -hmm. because with inflation and future expected inflation, are any of your clients saying, okay, we have to spend more money. Let's maybe pare back the investing a little bit. Well, um, I think in terms of, you know, there's an argument to be made that you should be doing all your home improvements now because there's a present value cost that we know in the future will get more expensive. So if you have the opportunity to accelerate that spending now, you're definitely locking in a savings if you believe that prices are going to increase, um, which I think is inevitable. Uh, now, in terms of investing, though, the, the antidote to inflation is investing. It's not moving to cash where we have a negative real rate. And so the solution set here really is to blend those two based on budget and lifestyle, obviously. But I really do want to bring that call to action for your typical investor that sees a lot of the economic data. They hear the word inflation and they fear based brings them to move to cash when that's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Uh, you should be stretching your, your finances and investing in asset classes that will help grow your money, literally, yeah. uh, in excess of, the, but, of those cost increases. But, and that's hard for people to get. But, right. But yeah. you have to acknowledge, too, that when you look at some of the gains that people have gotten mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, for some people, unanticipated gains, yeah. there's a sort of a desire, human nature, to want to... Mm -hmm protect that, to lock that in. Yes. Well, and, and you know, protect it from what, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, I, I understand that. And yet when markets go high, it doesn't mean they're not going to go higher. And if we truly are an inflationary cycle where asset bubbles get created, the place that you actually want to be are, is in assets yeah. uh, because that's where the appreciation is occurring. Now, from a tactical rebalancing standpoint, mm -hmm. Here within this market, it doesn't mean that you want to sit in your gains in the same sector. You should mm -hmm. be dynamically rotating portfolios into sectors that benefit based on current economic cycle and then these long-term growth themes that we've been talking about so much, you know, over yeah. the past month. All right. Well, right now, investors, at least for today, sitting on some pretty decent gains. Sherry Paul, Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management, sticking with us as we count you down to the closing bells. We're going to get to Sherry, uh, back to Sherry in a moment. Want to jump over to Taylor. Taylor, you're at the board for some reason. I'm still here at yeah. the board as I am every time at this day. Five minutes ago, take a look at shares of six sit, Stitch Fix. We were up as much as 7% earlier now, about 5% on the day. We're going to get earnings from them after the bell. Analysts are looking at a loss of 12 cents, all on revenue of about $571 million. That is for the last quarter that we just came through. But it's interesting that this number was over $100 a share earlier this year. So this is companies we think about that reopening trade where we are. Sherry, let me bring you back in here. Change up the board. We're looking at a really cool chart on the terminal about credit spreads. And frankly, a little bit here, and I'm saying a little bit and joking a little bit in yellow is high yield spreads we went up to about 310 basis points in the spread over treasuries not much but you could say look it's about the widest in the year mm -hmm. if we think cash is trash is credit spreads the place to be or is that showing signs of cracking as well 
Yeah, I think what we learned also during this, uh, you know, Delta deja vu moment uh, is that credit spreads in the bond market are not immune to variant volatility as well. So not surprising that we would see some bump in volatility. Uh, as far as like credit, yes, in some modest way, you want to continue to own credit in a portfolio, own it, uh, understanding that the short end of the curve is better than the long end of the curve, um, higher quality, uh, strong, strong corporate balance sheets issuing the credit, um, probably want to move away from treasuries. I heard earlier today uh, there was some talk about inflation protected securities and tips. We've held those in the portfolio for the better part of this year. Uh, that trade's getting a little bit long in the tooth right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think appropriately placed, but you know, again, I, the bond, I've said this before, the bond market is not the safe haven asset class of years gone by. This is a very different uh, asset class uh, in many ways forever changed due to government uh, intervention. And that has to have a huge psychological effect on how folks view equities though. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the dividend yield on the S&P and you think to yourself, well, should, you know, should I buy a 10-year treasury and I'm going to get 1.35 percent and I'll wait 10 years and get my money back, or I could buy a portfolio of high-quality securities and get, you know, 90 percent of that dividend yield today putting new cash to work, yeah. I think I would take the 10-year equity portfolio. Yeah.